The Cube at EMC World 2014 is brought to you by EMC, Redefine, VCE, innovating the world's first converged infrastructure solution for private cloud computing. Brocade, say goodbye to the status quo and hello to Brocade. Okay, we're back. This is Dave Vellante with Jeff Frick, and we're live here at EMC World 2014. This is theCUBE. theCUBE is a live mobile studio. We go out to the events. We extract the signal from the noise. Jim Hauska is here. He's the Director of Technology, Classified Ventures, LLC, Cars.com. Jim, welcome to theCUBE. Glad to be here. So Cars.com, we were talking off, off, off camera a little bit. You guys were founded in 1997, right in the middle of the bubble. And, um, and you survived that bubble, uh, unlike many companies. So first of all, congratulations. Uh, and uh, great to have you on theCUBE. Yeah, glad to be here. So uh, Classified Ventures, Cars.com was founded in 97, as you talked about, and essentially, uh, we're owned by, it's a joint venture with several media companies, Gannett, Belio, uh, Graham Holdings, um, Washington Post, and the Tribune Company. And essentially, the newspapers knew that there was a paradigm shift coming, and they knew that uh, technology or, or advertisements were moving away from paper and they would be moving uh, into the digital realm. So they had the, the forewithal to get together and come up with a plan to basically take their business digital and here we are today, almost 20 years later. So it's a joint venture between a number of media companies, is that right? That is correct, so uh, five media companies represent ownership in Cars.com. And it's pri privately held? It is privately held. Okay, and at one point it must have had just Back in the in 1999, for example, must have had just a what a 50, 60 billion dollar valuation <laughs> or something. <laughs> so, Best were, were the you there at the time, or I was not. I've been here for about five years. Oh, okay. So, um, well, I was going to ask you how things have, have evolved and how things have changed, but uh, well, five years is a long time. So, how in the past five years, how have things evolved? How is the whole venture working? Obviously, you guys are very successful. Maybe you can give us some some metrics or whatever you can share. Yeah, we've been tremendously successful. I've been here since 2009 and we've seen double digit growth every year both in revenue and op income and increased uh, site visitors, et cetera. I would say that uh, from the perspective of what has changed from a technology perspective, in 2011 we went through an agile transformation where we wanted to basically improve the, the time it takes for us to bring product to market. Uh, we went from doing you know, kind of a waterfall, 20, 30 projects per year with a lot of upfront planning and really you know, not that much success to um, an agile methodology where we're probably doing over 450 releases per year uh, in our new agile framework and we've been able to deliver superior products and services to market through our mobile and web applications. Can you talk about your data architecture a little bit? Um, sure, so we that. obviously we, we are looking to leverage data as a means to a competitive advantage. We have traditional enterprise data warehouse architectures and we have uh, more modern data frameworks we're looking at in terms of uh, in-memory uh, caching and in-memory grid solutions, modern data fabrics, uh, looking at Hadoop and HDFS as a means to uh, basically collect data, analyze the data, and make, make uh, determinations in real time in terms of how we can deliver customized content to consumers consuming our mobile and web applications. People talk about you know, structured content, unstructured content, you know, semi-structured content. You, you've got a little bit of each, right? Yeah, so we have our traditional kind of structured content that we're housing in, either our uh, Teradata or on the VMAX in terms of a block platform, and we have unstructured content specifically around images. Uh, that's an area where EMC's been tremendously a great partner in terms of our deployment of Isilon. We've been able to take, uh, essentially, if you look at our web applications, they're generating 4.7 billion requests for images per month. So we're leveraging Akamai as a CDN partner to offload maybe 60 to 85% of that, but that still leaves our internal dynamic imaging infrastructure serving over a billion images a month. So there's basically two components to that. The first is liquid pixels as a kind of dynamic rendering tier, and that has basically, let's say, 15 nodes connecting to a shared file system on the Isilon S series. That's basically the origin for all of our image processing. And you, I think I heard you say before, you, you, you're dabbling in or you, utilizing Hadoop technologies, is that right? Or? Yeah, so we've recently started to look at um, some HDFS, Hadoop, MapReduce deployments on you know, commodity hardware and are also looking at how, what Isilon could offer in terms of decoupling the compute from, from the storage component and being able to leverage, the, let's say, the same data across different protocols, across object, across uh, HDFS. I was, I was listening to Bill Richter the other day, uh, one of the sessions, and he said that HDFS is one of the, is the fastest growing part of the Isilon business. So 
are you going to use HDFS uh, or, or Currently uh, we're doing HDFS some uh, proof of value testing on Unted Known Cluster that's uh -huh. running on basically 2U commodity Cisco yeah. UCS hardware. But coming out of that, we're definitely going to look at um, uh, if Isilon makes sense in terms of basically being a centralized repository that we can tier in and out of based upon those needs. Yeah, the reason I ask is because you know you think about it, and you, I, you talk to a lot of practitioners and they just use the, the, the off-the-shelf drives and you know, especially when they're doing sandbox type of stuff. So the, 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 the question would be, what's, what would be the appeal of, of doing something like Isilon and HDFS and what would be the potential drawback? Simplicity, uh, manageability, uh, quick uh, time to deployment would be all appealing uh -huh. from an Isilon perspective. And the CapEx is going to be a little higher. In right? terms of, I guess there's this traditional mindset within the, the Hadoop uh, community that if it's not data locality of storage, it's not efficient. But if you look at like leading edge companies in terms of web, web scale companies like Facebook, they've already realized that they need to be able to decouple the compute from the storage via a high speed rack at the t uh, high speed top of switch rack. Yeah. And because they, they were either had too much compute or too much storage and they were you know, essentially purchasing excess, excess capacity they weren't because they were utilizing. buying it in blocks. Because and, they were and essentially they buying that. it as a all-in-one compute yeah. network storage, you know, one or two U pizza box. Interesting. So, it's interesting. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about agile methodology and how that transformed your company, not only into software development, go to market, how you guys are rolling out functionality, but how about in terms of the way you you operate? Is it is it changed? You know, kind of what you guys do and the way you look and the way you act. I would say tremendously, both from an infrastructure perspective as well as from a development perspective. Um, essentially, before there wasn't the worry about not being able to keep up with the demands of the business. Now there's the worry of we need to be able to keep up with the demands of the business because the business is driving you know, top line and bottom line growth for our company. And as we make more money, we invest more in technology and the cycle continues, right? So we definitely needed to put in place technologies uh, that are innovative, that basically provide us with competitive advantage to deliver our products to market faster. And the other thing, you got to have more flexibility in the way you grow that infrastructure, right? Because if you're not doing waterfall with these scheduled releases once every so often, but this continuous rollout, I imagine based on uptake and new features, you know, kind of reacting to real time information as to what's working and not working, you got to be able to flex up pretty quickly. Totally. We used to have a very big, uh, big blue footprint in terms of hardware and and middleware infrastructure, and we've been migrating to best of breed solutions. So we pulled in EMC VMAX with uh, Cisco UCS as our compute uh, infrastructure, as well as VMware as our virtualization layer, and we're looking at various other VMware assets from a, a cloud orchestration automation perspective. We've also deployed leading edge technologies like Splunk and CompuWare Dynatrace around uh, kind of log aggregation, data visualization, uh, being able to track transactions from the end user browser all the way to the back end. So really having full visibility, not only from an infrastructure perspective, but from how the end user experiences our applications. And I think that's a paradigm shift that the storage industry is going through from the perspective of, we used to design storage uh, from an infrastructure perspective, now we're designing storage from an, we're looking at storage from an application centric point of view. We're looking at policy driven automation and other things that can really uh, provide value in terms of this, this faster paced, agile product development life cycle that's really necessary to compete in today's modern business world. And I wonder if I could get your take on that, that last comment. So, right, taking an application view of the world, that's what you, you, you guys always want, but the, it's the industry has struggled to get there. But, but it, to the extent that the industry's been able to do that, it was all in application silos and you get purpose built systems for silos. Are you uh, constructing an infrastructure that, for the lack of a better term, call it more horizontal, where you're able to support more applications across the portfolio, or are you actually purpose building infrastructure for different apps? It's probably a combination of both. Obviously, we talked about we have some appliance based solutions that are providing very specific needs, which are kind of more uh, tactical than strategic, you could argue, because you're, you're choosing to solve things in a certain vertically stacked way, vertically integrated stacked way, but I would say the overarching premises or kind of approach that we've been looking at is horizontal scalability at all tiers, meaning that um, traditionally in a, in a three tier or four tier architecture, you struggle when you get down to the data fabric tier because it's not necessarily horizontally scalable in the way that let's say a web or app tier is. So really looking at how we can leverage modern data fabrics that create horizontal scalability that enables to basically abstract away some of the constraints associated with uh, you know, vertically scaled components of your architectures, such as like uh, OLTP type components. Jimmy, your, your company's growing very fast. Um, is your IT budget growing very, very fast? <laughs> I would say not as fast as the company is growing, but we have been able to make a lot of strategic investments in technology innovation that, you know, have, have made a lot of uh, 
headway for us. But still, it's never, it, the, the, the demands of the business are always growing faster than your ability to support it from a, from a financial perspective. So, does that mean that your IT budget as a percentage of revenues is, is declining? If the I revenues would say are growing it's not, faster it's not, it's, I, I don't know off the top of my head exactly, but I would say that How's we've been feel? remaining yeah. relatively stable and even trying to say, are there ways we can take it down a little bit? Yeah, okay. if, we make, if we have major purchasing cycles where we're bringing in large amounts of uh, whatever it may be, um, the next year, we, you know, we may not have that same major purchasing cycle because we have maybe a three-year asset life on whatever we just brought in. So you have the, you still have the do do more with less pressure, uh, sure, but because yeah. you're so high growth, you actually have the luxury of getting, you know, more funding <laughs> than many uh, IT organizations. Yes, I would say that, but it's still the do more with uh, either the same, or uh, do more maybe not same. do more with less, but <laughs> do more with the same. And when it demands are being increased upon you, then it's do more with less, essentially. Okay, so, I, so how much of your time do you spend trying to figure out, if you had to take a, 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 a pie, how much of your time do you spend trying to figure out how to do more with less versus how to drive business value uh, with new initiatives? We take the viewpoint of Anytime we're uh, looking at a new initiative, we need to know what's the question, what is the business value? How is this going to enable the business? How is this going to help us drive profitability, consumer engagement, um, et cetera? Do you allocate some percentage to kind of greenfield opportunities that are, you know, kind of the classic 10% go off and explore and experiment because there might not be an immediate evident kind of ROI? So we have a really strong architecture team that uh, participates in a lot of different POCs and kind of ex exploration of new technologies. And then generally speaking, we look to deploy the ones that we know are going to provide immediate business value, and then we keep our eyes out for maybe industry trends or things that are changing over time that we still need to be uh, aware of, but maybe are not actionable at, at any given point. But we try to spend a significant portion of our time uh, looking at the strategic and how we get out in front of the business or stay in line with the business versus kind of being left behind. So if I use the old meta group uh, taxonomy, run the business, grow the business, transform the business, obviously you know, a small portion of that's going to be transform, right? You can't have the whole budget being done transform, but, but, but run the business and grow the business. Grow the business seems to be, I'm inferring anyway, a big part of your emphasis. Yeah, we have a, we have a very big, uh, portion of our efforts related to growing the business. For example, when we were talking about the Isilon cluster, you know, if you're, if you're serving billions of image requests per month, we had essentially a legacy platform serving that, that not only presented organizational risk from a DR perspective, it also was very difficult to manage and it was not performant. When we brought Isilon in, we were basically able to reduce our kind of core image serving processing time frame uh, during peak from one second to 100 milliseconds or during non-peak traffic from 250 milliseconds to 100 milliseconds. So now we're essentially serving that 100 milliseconds across the board, which is essentially a 250 to 1,000 percent increase in performance. Not to mention the manageability is in, in scalability is, is just way, way better than what we had before. We used to dread having to, uh, we, we were spending a lot of time managing our storage versus getting insights out of our data. When you say you bring in, bring Isilon in, are you are you bringing in a box? Are you bringing in a solution? Is it a combination? Are you having to build that solution? Is EMC helping you build that solution? How does yeah. that all work? Out? So in this case, we have a ver relatively simplistic three-node S-series cluster in production that has uh, roughly around 250 million images on it, uh, maybe 150 million or so, which are active. And dealers, as they're updating their inventory they want to get that inventory off their lot. We have roughly 20,000 dealer customers. They want to get that inventory off their lot as soon as possible because they're paying interest on that inventory. So they want their pictures of their vehicles to be on the site as quick as possible. Right now it's around 35 minutes uh, in terms of time to glass and when those images come online. So we really were looking for ways not only to improve the speed at which we get things online, but also make the customer experience better. You're not going to go out and buy a, you know, what is one of your more expensive purchases in your lifetime, a car, without being able to see a lot of detailed images that kind of entice you to go to the dealership to look at or test drive that vehicle per se. I'm curious over time with the whole big data and, and, and lots of different uh, data sets out there, have you guys started to bring in any other kind of third party data over time to, to enhance your solution? Yeah, so we use a variety of third party data aggregators that basically pull in data from dealer management systems, the DMI ADP is an example of one of them. So they have access into all the dealer management systems and as dealers update their inventory, we have a feed process that basically pulls those into 
into our systems. And uh, there's another area where Iceland provided a lot of value in terms of, we used to be able to process around 80,000 images of an hour, meaning downloading them from, from the uh, dealer aggregated services. And now we can do almost 300,000 images per hour. So we've been able to, and in all likelihood, those images are of, of higher uh, pixelation or, or in terms of quality. So better quality. How do you system. protect all this? Unstructured so data. We, we have, uh, from the perspective of our images, we leverage replication from our primary data center to our secondary data center, which serves, serves as both a, a DR and a kind of staging performance testing environment. So uh, from that, that perspective, we try to rely on replication as much as possible, either at the application layer or at the infrastructure layer, but then we also have uh, inline deduplicated backup solutions, data domains, semantic net backup, uh, snapshotting technologies, other things like that. So. Jim, thanks for coming on theCUBE. I'll give you the last word here. How, what, for, to, to talk to your peers. What kind of advice would you give them in terms of, if they're struggling with this multi-structured data problem, um, what would you tell them is the, the thing they should be most focused on? I would say look for a very specific use case that's going to drive business value, and then you know be a champion and drive that business case through, and then once you see the successful results of that, and you're gaining the, the benefits of it, you can use that to kind of cascade into your next endeavor. Don't try to uh, start small and iterate. Don't try to you know, eat the elephant in one bite. All right, Jim, we'll leave it there. Thanks very much for coming on theCUBE and uh, sharing your insights. Keep it right there, everybody. Jeff Frick and I will be back with our next guest. This is theCUBE, we're live from EMC World 2014. We'll be right back. <laughs>